Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we have an exciting episode as we look forward to Yuri's Night. Monday, April 12th, marks the 60th anniversary of the first human space flight, as well as the 40th anniversary of the first flight of the space shuttle. We're going to visit with three-time shuttle astronaut Dr. Katherine Sullivan, the first American woman to walk in space. But first, we discuss Yuri's night and look forward to the return of humans to the moon. We learn about the International Lunar Research Station, a new plan by Russia and China to place dozens of people on the lunar surface on a permanent basis in the coming years. We are also going to take a look at the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, one of NASA's next generation space telescopes, which will soon search our galaxy for unknown worlds. On April 12, 1961, Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first human to leave the Earth venturing into space. This 27-year-old former military pilot made just one orbit of the Earth during his 89-minute flight before landing back on our planet. However, this historic flight opened the age of human spaceflight forever. Exactly 20 years later, on April 12, 1981, NASA first launched the Space Shuttle, the world's first reusable spacecraft. Although capable of holding up to seven astronauts, the first flights of the shuttle held a crew of just two people. This first flight of Columbia was commanded by veteran astronaut John Young and piloted by Bob Crippen. This year, on the heels of Yuri's Night, the space agencies of Russia and China have announced they will work together to develop permanent human colonies on and around the moon. The International Lunar Research Station will house between 10 and 30 people at one time once it is fully constructed. Russia was once a leader in space exploration, and China has recently carried out historic missions to the Moon and Mars. No firm date has yet been announced for the construction of the lunar colony. The Nancy Grace Roman Telescope readying for launch sometime in the mid-2020s, may be able to find up to 100,000 planets orbiting other stars. Once launched into space, this observatory will orbit the Sun roughly a million miles from Earth. Although it is only the same size as the Hubble Space Telescope, the Roman Telescope will be able to see a hundred times as much sky in each image. This revolutionary infrared telescope could radically alter our knowledge of exoplanets and potentially aid in the search for life on other worlds. Astronomers examining data from the Chandra Space Telescope found X-rays radiating from the planet Uranus. Similar displays have been seen before on other worlds, including Earth and Saturn. Analysis shows most of this emission is likely driven by radiation from the Sun, but rings around the planet and oral displays at the poles of this lopsided ice giant planet might also be responsible for the energetic emissions. Now, join us next week as we welcome Ophelia Wibisano of University College London 
discussing her work on this intriguing discovery of x-rays from Uranus. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week, we are delighted to talk with three-time shuttle astronaut, Dr. Katherine Sullivan. She helped launch the Hubble Space Telescope and was the first American woman to walk in space. She later served as NOAA Administrator under President Obama, and last year she became the first woman in the world to visit the deepest part of the ocean, Challenger Deep. On April 20th, Dr. Sullivan will be awarded the Nevada Medal from the Desert Research Institute Foundation. We caught up with Dr. Sullivan during an online press conference announcing the award. You might say uh, that you've had a life full of highs and lows from the space shuttle, three flights on the space shuttle, to the depths of the Mariana Trench. Can you tell us a little bit about the, how those experiences compared and what uh, deep sea expeditions are like compared to space travel? Yeah, James, you put your finger right on what my friends commonly say. They, they describe me as just a, a woman who has extreme ups and downs. Um, <laughs> uh, the, contrasts, the contrasts are pretty glaring and straightforward. And the big ones are leaving the planet to go to outer space is an explosive event. It's very short, it's very intense. You know, it only takes eight and a half minutes to get into orbit. Uh, leaving the surface of the Earth to go to the bottom of the deep sea is a much more peaceful, calm, smooth, uh, it's you know, like a serene elevator ride, basically. Uh, another big difference is you know, the scale of view that you have from the vantage point of a spacecraft or the vantage point of a submersible. From a spacecraft, you can see about a thousand miles in any dimension from the altitudes that we flew at. And in a submersible, you can only see as far as the lights that you brought with you illuminate. And in the deep, deep sea, that's commonly around 30 feet. Interestingly, some of the technical challenges are the same. You're either going to have too much pressure outside your craft or too little, and you have to make sure the craft is sturdy enough to keep, keep you in a Goldilocks zone where there's just the right amount of pressure, the right gases to breathe, uh, some amount of uh, controllable temperature range. So that's, that kind of sums it up. James, it, it was a great delight, and I think sort of the highlight of my NASA career, to be part of the crew that put Hubble into orbit. Uh, I did not actually fly on any of the missions that repaired it, but my role in the repair missions was pretty, pretty pivotal. For the five years leading up to our 1990 mission to take Hubble to orbit, uh, my crewmate Bruce McCandless and I worked alongside a batch of engineers from several parts of NASA and the companies that were building Hubble to make sure that once Hubble was in orbit, we already had built and tested and proven on, on Earth every tool that might be needed to ever repair Hubble and the support equipment, you know, cradles and dollies and things like that, that spacewalking astronauts would need to carry out those repairs. Uh, that really paid huge dividends, as you will recall, when it turned out that Hubble couldn't see straight at the outset. And being able to use those tools and that equipment uh, not many years later uh, to put in the optical devices that corrected Hubble's sight uh, was the make or break moment for the mission. Now, there were four other repair missions after that one, and over time, the, the confidence and capability of the NASA team and the Lockheed team uh, just continued to grow. So by the fourth and fifth servicing mission, 
they were inventing whole new ranges of tools and capabilities. I, I would characterize it as the, the tool and equipment that we prepared before taking Hubble to orbit was kind of like the stuff you would need to change a tire on your car. It was pretty, you know, unbolt this and move that there. Vital stuff, but fairly simple uh, in that regard. And by the time you get to the fourth servicing mission, uh, they're doing things that are more like precision hand surgery. They're opening up high precision optical boxes and opening up the instrument shells and replacing circuit cards, things that we would never have dreamt possible in 1990. So it's really a, a fabulous story uh, and an untold story by and large, a fabulous story of invention and inventiveness that has kept Hubble alive uh, from its deployment in 1990 until today. And shameless plug follows. If you want to read a little more about that fabulous story of invention, uh, pick up my book, Handprints on Hubble, because the reason I wrote it was that the engineers that did all that work and this untold chapter of the story really deserve to be on the record and known to everybody. Uh, it's really, as I said, it really is the reason that Hubble is still going strong twice as long as was projected by our design engineers at the beginning. Join us next week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion when we talk with Ophelia Wabasano of University College London. We'll be talking about this new intriguing discovery of X-rays coming from Uranus. Subscribe or follow this show today to never miss an episode. Please join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. Subscribers to our VIP newsletter see every episode of this show a day before the general public. We depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or on any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank mm -hmm. you.